Welcome to A Seat at the Table with Bishop John Dolan of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Phoenix. I'm your host, Joyce Coronel, and we have an exciting show for you today. I think you're really going to enjoy hearing from our guest, Father David Leffler. He is the pastor of Holy Spirit Newman Center at Grand Canyon University, but he's also the director of Ecumenism and Interreligious Affairs for the Diocese of Phoenix. So, Father David, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much. And Bishop John, great to have you here. In his apostolic exhortation, Pope Francis urges us to participate in dialogue with other religions and with other non-Catholic Christians. So, I have some questions for you. Father David, what is ecumenical dialogue? What does it look like? And maybe could you give us some colorful examples of how you've seen it done well? Sure. So ecumenism, broadly speaking, um, refers to efforts and initiatives towards uh, the unity of Christians. Christ desired that we all be one. Uh, And so as I'm growing to love Christ more, I need to love what he loves and desire what he desires, uh, desire that we might be united in the fullness of truth. And it plays out lots of ways practically. I I think of this on different levels in a sense. Um, On a larger scale and an institutional level, there are some dialogues, formal dialogues that take place between theologians of, um, from Catholic theologians and Lutheran theologians or Methodist theologians or whichever the case may be, informal dialogues. So there's some things that play out at that kind of level, having conversations to understand each other better. It also plays out sometimes in ways we can collaborate on things that we do agree on. A practical example I think of relating to this here in Arizona um, is there's a group called Arizona Faith Network that we participate with that has representatives of of different faith traditions, many of them Christian, but some from other religions as well. And a common concern that was coming up was a rise over the past few years in violence around churches and synagogues, places were being attacked. Um, And so these different faith groups were able to come together and say, uh, well, even though there are some things that we disagree on, there's much that we agree on the importance of religion, of faith in God. This is something where we can maybe speak with a unified voice and they were able to pull together to help advance some initiatives at the state legislature um, to help pass a bill that was giving money to local churches or synagogues in order to help with their security program in particular areas. So that's something where like a concrete change was able to happen because of these different groups coming together and speaking with a unified voice on the things that we can to, to raise a concern. But the last level that I think of is probably the most practical for most people is even just at a personal level. Honestly, I think this is where the bulk of ecumenical and interreligious relationships and conversations happen is in daily life. We all have family members or friends or coworkers uh, who are in another Christian denomination or maybe in some other religion. And we interact with them regularly and have conversations about all kinds of things. I think the way that we foster those relationships, the way we have those conversations can do a lot to help uh, help us grow together towards the fullness of truth or a way. So a practical example of that that I think of just recently, I have a a friend named Vasu who is a Buddhist monk and he has been having some trouble recently with a condition with his eye where he's losing sight, which I can't even imagine what that's like to do. And that led to a, just a beautiful conversation we were having about suffering and the meaning of suffering and how do you deal with suffering? What strengthens you and pulls you through? Uh, and we just got to have this beautiful conversation about the nature of suffering and the lived experience of suffering. Even though he's a Buddhist monk and I'm a Catholic priest, we were able to see some things we have in common or ways that we approach things differently. And definitely by the end of the conversation, felt closer to each other. Like. I have a brother here uh, and we're grappling with these mysteries. Uh, I think most people have these kinds of interactions all the time, just in daily life. It's part of our lived experience. What a great example, because I I think the tendency so often is to put people in boxes because it's just easier to think about. It's less complicated. And when you get to actually know an individual human person, they have a story. And so you've talked about, you talked about our universal, like every person is going to suffer. Right. And so what what a beautiful example. And Bishop John, tell us a little bit about how you've lived this, how you've seen it 
maybe some examples in your own life where you've had that kind of a fruitful exchange? Well, I think just practically speaking, as Father David was saying, you know, most people, generally speaking, unless they're at church 24-7, um, are going to be rubbing shoulders with people of different traditions, different faiths, different walks of life. So it's just natural and very practical. Sometimes we get into our little theological box and think we forget that, in essence, most of our day is spent in you know, a gas station, Safeway, or wherever, and we're running into people of all different walks of life and different faith traditions or non-faith traditions. And um, the the point of evangelization, um, or rather um, ecumenism and interreligious dialogue, is is to first recognize that we're all on the same planet, but we're all, uh, you know, different in our ways of thinking. At the same time, we don't want to just simply say, um, live and let be, because we also believe, you know, from our own tradition, that there is a uh, there is a certain fullness of truth that is celebrated within our church that we don't want to let go of. And we want to, you know, uh, celebrate, but also encourage. For example, kind of, we're, we are a sacramental church. Not every church within our Christian enterprise is a sacramental church, but we believe so much so in the sacrament that the very presence of Christ is, is, is there, say, in the Eucharist, but also the very presence of God is incarnate in every aspect of who we are. And that isn't always celebrated in other people's lives, and that's something we want to encourage, but delicately, not ramming it down their throat or not condemning it, those who don't have that same tradition. But I think what uh, Father David is bringing to the table is is a very important piece of any ecumenical or interreligious uh, communication, and that is, are we authentic in our in our relationship with others? Are we truly loving? Because that's going to go before everything that we do as a church, including our sacramental life, uh, our ecumenical and interreligious life, our evangelization life. Everything that we do has to begin and end with love. And it means authentic love, relational love, uh, communal love, which okay. then creates ecumenism, interreligious dialogue and more than dialogue, um, you know, relationships, and also encourages evangelization, which is about love. Mm -hmm. I really like this word authenticity because you asked about ecumenism done well, because there is this reality of it can be done poorly as well. <laughs> That's very possible. And I think it's so important um, that we're being authentic because I think when any kind of dialogue is done well, I need to be myself. I don't cease to be myself. And I don't want the other person to cease to be themselves either so that we can have a genuine encounter between two persons. Uh, if I kind of tiptoe or water things down or I'm acting in a way that's artificial or kind of forced or, um, or if the other person does or if we both do, then we don't have a genuine encounter. I think this authenticity is, is so, so important. Yeah. I think those are those are good observations, and I I think you know you just have to turn on the news and look at what's happening around our world. There's such a need for people of faith to pray for peace and to pray for understanding. Um, you see the various wars uh, that are going on right now. I, it seems like it's important for us to understand people of different faith traditions. So that's it's a little different from I know you talked about the Buddhist monk. Um, we have some new, some neighbors who are Jewish. We've gone to their home. We have, we have neighbors who are evangelical. And then next to them is a, is a home of observant Jews. And they invite us over for Hanukkah. And it, it's a beautiful celebration. We all go together. Um, and I, and I really enjoy that. And we've tried to invite them to, to our things as well. Just promotes just friendliness in the neighborhood. Obviously there, there are some differences, but there's, there's peace, there's understanding when one of us is sick, you know, we're looking out for each other when someone's on vacation, you know, is that, is that car supposed to be in front of their house? Right. So just a little bit of interreligious dialogue. Father David, where do you see potential opportunities for us as a church to enter into more interreligious dialogue? Where would that be happening? That's a great question. 
I suppose that it it plays out in various levels, like I was saying before. But for most people, I think one of the spheres where this plays out in a big way today in particular is so much of our information or so much of what forms our hearts and minds is online content. Nowadays, for better or worse, it can go either way on that. And I think it can be a really fruitful thing, and it it needs to be if we're going to try to to follow Christ, uh, to be an important thing that we are trying to avoid stereotypes or to be well informed. We don't like when other people make caricatures of us. Why would we want to do that to other people? Um, a lot of the times, it's easy to oversimplify things or. As societies become kind of more and more polarized, it's easy to, to kind of pit an us against them, but it's not really accurately portraying them or us. To try to avoid those um, superficial divisions and uh, really get to know people, to be authentic and to want to know others in an authentic way, I think is like a ground level thing that everyone can do and needs to do because we encounter these, whether we want to or not. Um, things we see in videos or in news stories to be able to give the benefit of the doubt where it's reasonable and makes sense to do so, to try to genuinely understand. There's this phrase Pope Paul VI used that I really like. He said, um, to, to des desire to understand what people have it in their hearts to say, not only the words they actually said. What, what are they trying to communicate? What are they trying to express? To really want to understand, not just to be looking for kind of a, a buzz phrase or a thing I can jump on. Um, I think that's so important, but it's a habit that we have to form in daily life. And that implies, I would think, more of this incarnational sitting down together, right. not virtually and not uh, critiquing other videos, but actually spending time with people who are who are different from us. I had this experience about a month ago. I was at, at the salon, as ladies do, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a group of women that I that I didn't know sitting next to me. And one of them started making some really catty remarks about Catholics, just like the whole stereotypical, it, it just went on and on. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm not fuming, but I'm thinking, Lord, am I supposed to say something? And pretty sure I heard back, nope, <laughs> not, not your rodeo. <laughs> you need to just like, let it be. And then I, I know that the woman who cuts my hair, she knows I work for the diocese. I'm pretty sure when I walked out of there, she said, to the other one, not a, not a good combo to be to be having, which is fine. I wouldn't want her to to, to be embarrassed, but I think in moments of candor, uh, people, you know, they often do have stereotypes or they do have misapprehensions about others. And if you just took the opportunity to get to know the other person as a as a person, I think sometimes we have like this monolithic idea of all Catholics are this way, all Methodists are one way, all, you know, Latter-day Saints. And it's really that we're individuals. Mm -hmm. How have you seen that, Bishop? Well, you know, the, the, you brought it up, uh, the, the concept of peace. And, and in this very divided world, we're seeing that, you know, Jerusalem, I was, I was reflecting on um, Melchizedek, who was the king of, Sh uh, of Shalom. Um, or Salem, uh, which is Shalom and Jerusalem, uh, is 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 really the place where peace is supposed to reign. Uh, the King of Peace came, the Prince of Peace came to there. But and so you have these. There's a Christian tradition there, the Jewish tradition. You have the Muslim tradition there. It's all there, and it's not the sense of peace is not. Um, God is there. And they would each acknowledge God, the very presence of God. But the sense of peace it just appears not to be there. And I think Pope Francis really hit it on the head when he talked about this coming jubilee and the year of hope. And the very first hope of his 10 lists, his, his list of 10 hopes, is peace. And how can we tangibly acknowledge that? And really, a lot of that has to do with getting back to internalizing uh, this call for our own, our, our own call for peace. Am I really wanting to be a peacemaker? You know, am I really wanting to have acknowledging that there are differences in our traditions, in our faith, and in our uh, expressions of faith? Even am I truly, authentically a peacemaker, or am I? kind of faking it? Am I pretending that God 
you know, they're just kind of hoping God is not watching this, you know, because if I'm not a peacemaker, I'm, man, it's it's really hard to get about, you know, unity, and it's really hard to get about love. I can talk about that, but if I'm not a peacemaker, boy, that's going to be tough. Yeah. So, you know, I pr- appreciate the fact that you just opened that question up, you know, about the concept of the divisions in our world. Um, and, and it's it's seen right there in, in the Holy Land right now. There's just the, the lack of, of peace is exhibit A that we have a long way to go. Yeah. And maybe, maybe we will never see that until the Lord comes again. Well, Ultimately, it has to be his work. Correct. Right? Yeah. It is so moving when you go to the Holy Land and you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if... You know, if you've seen that there, the ladder that's over over the door, the unmovable ladder that's been there for, I think, over 100 years because there was some inter-Nicene uh, quarrel about who could move what. And, you know, you sometimes there will be a scuffle there in the church because there there's a very ordered procedure as to, you know, who gets to have their service at what time. And I remember interviewing the uh, the Muslim gate, the, the basically the guy who holds the key to the door. It's been in his family for hundreds of years. And so someone very wisely hundreds of years ago said, no, it won't be in any one of the Christian denominations that it, it falls to open the church each day it will be this Muslim family because we know like they don't have a stake in any of these particular <laughs> denominations. So he was such a, he was such a character, even had a business card. Um, <laughs> but one thing I remember about walking up to that door is I, I had never met any one of the Russian Orthodox tradition. And we saw a number of pilgrims there from that particular tradition. And I remember there was a woman and they wear this black, it's like a, almost like a turban, but not sort of pointy, very distinctive. And I remember her just striding towards these big, huge doors on the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which Catholics hold this is where our Lord, you know, was crucified and, and buried, right? Seeing the resurrection, all that. She walks towards these doors and she just puts her hand there and then just rests her forehead against the wood of the door. And she's just, you can see her lips moving. She's praying and you're thinking, Mm -hmm. I don't know what road led to that moment, but I found myself praying for her and wishing I I could understand what it was. Like, how can we understand others? How can we grow in this? Do you think, Father David? That's a great question. I think um, listening is an important part, obviously. And listening not just to words, but like I was saying, what it is that people have in their hearts to say, entering into the experience before I'm judging right away to genuinely seek to understand, it kind of opens our perspective. But another aspect of this that maybe seems counterintuitive that I was thinking of just a moment ago is in it's easier to see and to talk about listening because that's kind of like a clear example. But on the speaking side, I think that's important as well. And some people, sometimes people have a concern that we'll talk about, oh, let's just listen to each other, but we never really share anything that it could be too positive or where's evangelization, sharing good news, that kind of a thing, right? And I think that is an important component of it as well to be able to share my experience, to be able to share what I believe to be true, um, to be able to invite others to practical things, like you had mentioned in inviting your your Jewish friends to some of the events at the parish. They can always say no if they don't want to, but everybody likes being invited. Right. Parish it's nice festival. to be invited that way. Parish festival. Yeah. Fun. And so I think all of that has a place as well. And sometimes is very necessary because sometimes that's how we initiate a conversation. If I'm only ever listening, then I'll never initiate anything. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it starts with an invitation, or could we get together sometime and chat? Or would you like to come to this? So I think speaking has to happen as well for the conversation to go back and forth. And to Bishop's point about peacemaking, I think when we're able to listen well, but also share in a way that's authentic and recognizes the dignity of the person sitting across the table from me, um, we both get to experience, but we also give an example of what that kind of interaction can look like, where we might disagree, but in a fruitful way. And I think that helps build the peace that Bishop's describing. It doesn't necessarily mean we agree right away, but we can have conversations, sometimes even hard conversations, um, in a, a charitable way with a deep concern for the other, a deep love. Excellent. Well, as we wrap up today, Bishop, do you have any closing thoughts for us about this wonderful topic? Uh, well, I would say let peace begin with me. <laughs> now, obviously, it is God 
but God is, you know, is, has found a way to be present in each and every one of us. And so we need to be peacemakers. And that includes ecumenical and interreligious dialogue and com, you know, uh, communion. Amen to that. So let's be peacemakers. Bishop, Father David, thank you so much for being with us here today. God bless each of you. Thank you.